Hello, everyone, and welcome to our January sustainability series. I'm pleased to introduce Mindy Granley, the sustainability officer for the city of Duluth, who is joining us today. She is responsible for improvement of Duluth city policies, programs, and initiatives in support of local environmental, economic, and social systems. In her role, she incorporates sustainability into decision making measures and communicates progress and builds partnerships for change. During her first two years at the city of Duluth, Cindy led, Mindy led creation of the city's first climate action work plan, pushed for adoption of new performance standards for city owned buildings, established an interdepartmental sustainability advisory team and led multiple successful grant funded projects with the city and community partners. Previously, she served for 12 years as the sustainability director at the University of Minnesota Duluth, reducing campus emissions and integrating sustainability into the learning experiences for all students. Her academic training is in watershed management, earning an MS from the University of Minnesota. Prior to her sustainability career, she spent six years helping to protect northern Minnesota trout streams and Lake Superior that she loves. Mindy holds a BS in geology and hydro hydrogeology, an MS in water resources science, and is a certified energy manager. Mindy and Duluth are a great partner in our climate smart municipalities that the city of Rochester also participates in. And it's been a great joy getting to know her and the projects that Duluth has been working on over the last couple of years since we've both enjoyed our roles here with each of our cities. Her presentation title today is Climate Progress Up North. And with that, I'll hand it over for Mindy to share, share stories and strategies from the first year of implementing Duluth City's Climate Action Work Plan. Thank you, Mindy. Thank you, Lauren. Um, just want to give a shout out to Lauren and Kevin and thank my colleagues in Rochester for their work and inspiration and support since I began. Um, I feel like Rochester maybe got in the game a little bit earlier for climate planning and sustainability work. So um, just want to thank them for their leadership and support since I began. Um, I've been watching your community resiliency planning efforts and sustainability planning efforts and your benchmarking programs and so much more and learning from you. So thank you all. Um, also, thanks to Mayor Norton and the Climate Smart Municipalities Program for their inspiration and to all the residents who help shape Rochester's sustainability work. Um, I'm happy to chat with you today about our work, but also want to let you know that I'm inspired by your work. So um, let's get started. Um, so up north, I am a team of one. I am the sustainability officer for the city of Duluth. I've been here since 2020. Um, so heading into my third year, which has um, just been a whirlwind. Um, so I really take a whole city approach to this work um, because I'm one person um, and I sit at the leadership team within our city. So all the directors of all the departments are my colleagues. So I really focus on relationship building and working across departments um, and recently applying for cooperative grants and just building capacity within the city for our initiatives. And I really accomplish my work through listening um, to community, but also informing and influencing decision making at the city and inspiring change in different departments and sectors. So those of you who are uh, professionals that work in municipal government, you know those people who don't stay in their swim lanes? That's me, that's sustainability in Duluth. I'm all over the board. Um, but I'm lucky to have lots of great colleagues and a city sustainability advisory team. I realized early on that we needed to come to some agreements uh, before we could get started on climate planning. And so that CSAT team, came together, it's 18 members across 11 different departments in the city, and they've been a, a huge support of the climate action work. So just a shout out to the CSAT team. Um, my staff uh, consists of AmeriCorps VISTA named Parker, um, who's our energy and sustainability assistant, and also Lydia, who's my community resiliency and energy specialist, who's a lead for America fellow. And then we have a brand new intern from UMD, Ella, who's our sustainability communications intern. So just wanna shout out to them and say thank you to them. And then um, the work in Duluth is benefited by some of these um, statewide and national organizations like the USDN, Green Step Cities, ICLE, Climate Smart, and then the Great Lakes One Water Partnership. So super grateful to all of these partners. We can't do it alone. We need everybody. Um, also a thanks to our uh, public external advisory board, the Energy Plan Commission, which serves the city by helping advise us on our greenhouse gas emission reduction goals. So thank you to all the commissioners. Some of you may be watching. Um, 
Lastly, on the climate smart municipalities, Lauren mentioned this before, this is a partnership between Minnesota and German cities. Um, and um, our most recent effort within climate smart was hosting an intern from Germany named Niels, who spent the summer with us in 2022 and helped me with the pre work needed to apply for a big Department of Energy grant for solar planning, which I'll get to. Um, but just wanted to give a shout out to Niels and thank him for his work. Okay, so let's get to the climate action work plan. Um, we really base our climate action planning around some of the initial agreement that we had in existing plans, like Imagine Duluth 2035, our comprehensive plan. Energy and conservation strategies were embedded throughout, sustainability strategies were embedded throughout, housing, transportation, land use, and all of the policies in that. Um, but what it didn't say is exactly what we should do for climate. So what we did was use these sort of foundational plans um, and we took some, um, some advice and some guidance from the Duluth Citizens Climate Action Plan, which was published in 2020, um, which started long before this position was even created at the city. But our residents really got together and said, this is the climate, that we, climate action that we envision. So we took a lot of inspiration from that. Um, the, the mayor's climate goals obviously played a part in us creating a climate action work plan. And the city council um, of Duluth declared a climate emergency in April of 2021. And that was really where they codified that we needed a climate action work plan, that we need to give annual reports and um, have progress um, made publicly available. So a long story short, all of these things added up to where we got to with our climate action plan. I think um, it just goes to show that city leaders agree and support climate action. And it goes beyond the mayor and beyond city council. It's also um, comes from our residents as well. And I'm grateful that the city made staffing this possible and at a really high level in our organization, which gives me direct access to my colleagues who are in charge of city departments. So using this strong foundation, I was able to get agreement on a five-year climate action work plan, um, which really consists of two phases. And the first phase is let's get started. <laughs> let's drive down emissions. Let's strengthen community resilience, eliminate some barriers and enable some policy and let's seek some financial and workforce pathways. It also identified some shovel ready projects that we could just get started on right away. Um, and then phase two, which is moving towards full community decarbonization. Um, but we want to build sort of foundation in this phase one. Um, and we, we base the plan and kind of rank all the actions around nine strategies that the council recommended, um, which include reducing energy from buildings, increasing efficiency and resilience in our utilities, supporting low carbon transportation, improving stormwater, et cetera. Our municipal emissions, so the city caused emissions, are really dominated by um, water and wastewater pumping, treatment and pumping. Um, after that, it's buildings and facilities. So when we look at sort of our utilities and providing critical services and infrastructure and our buildings, that's the majority of our, our carbon footprint. Um, we've been working really hard to reduce the, the pie piece of street lights and traffic signals. We're converted to almost 90% LEDs within the city now. Um, so a, a lot of work has been done in that area. Um, we also have emissions from our vehicle fleet, which are staying pretty stagnant and, and need some work. Um, just want to give you a little background on city emissions. These differ from community-wide emissions, um, and not just in sort of where they fall, but also in the intensity. So the city municipal emissions, like caused by our organization, are way less than 5% of our total community-wide emissions. And we realize that as we work on reducing city emissions, we're also thinking about how do we get towards that community scale. Um, and those are dominated by, again, uh, buildings, residential buildings, energy to heat and power and cool residential buildings, and also commercial buildings. Um, and then 20% is travel and 1% is waste. So um, phase one is really about reducing these city emissions um, and then preparing the policies and things that we need to get to full decarbonization phase two, which is reducing these citywide emissions. All right, to set the stage, um, one of the, the there's four objective tables in our city climate action work plan. Um, and the first is just, you know, when the bathtub's overflowing, the first thing you do is turn off the tap, right? Is reduce emissions. So the first objective is really locked in around how do we uh, work on the city's emissions from our buildings, from our fleet, from our utilities and our services. And after one year, we've made some progress 
in four of the actions, and we've made significant progress in two, and I'll try to highlight some of that um, through these stories. Um, so we to work on reducing emissions, obviously when we went and ran towards buildings and utilities, because that's where our emissions are coming from. So we continue to do things like lighting retrofits and building projects. One of the big projects happening right now is a city hall full HVAC um, improvement. Um, so our heating, ventilation, and air conditioning systems pretty much have not been touched um, for many, many years. And um, we're moving towards electrification and using a variable refrigerant flow system. Um, it's not an easy job to take a building that is pretty much on steam radiator heat and then flip it and get it into a variable refrigerant flow. But um, this will also add and improve the ventilation in City Hall, um, which was very subpar. Um, and so we're looking forward to that, but we'll also reduce energy efficiency by over 30%. So we're really excited about that project. Um, we also adopted building owner performance requirements, which will be applied to all city projects in the future. Um, so that policy was adopted in November 2021, and it really outlines that we have these climate goals and we want to meet them and that we need to get more aggressive about energy transition. So um, that was a major step forward. Um, Duluth has a thermal energy district in our downtown, and it's called Duluth Energy Systems. Um, 10 years ago, it was dominated by a fuel source of coal, and now it is dominated by a fuel source of natural gas, which we also realize um, needs to be part of our energy transition. Um, so we have right now a five-year plan for coal elimination. We still use it as a backup fuel, um, but we're really looking towards how do we get away from using that even as a backup fuel source? Although it has come in handy for resiliency, um, like in January of 2022, when a contractor hit a major natural gas supply line into the city. And um, one thing that DES did was switch to coal for those two or three days while they were repairing that um, gas main, um, which allowed other folks to be able to use the limited amount of gas that was coming into our community. So it was, it was nice to have as a resiliency backup, but we're really looking forward to eliminating the use of coal um, and the bag house and all the things that come with it and finding alternative energy sources. Um, to do that, we have a, a co-application in for a geothermal district heating and heat recovery grant. And I'll talk about that a little bit more um, at the end. But they continue to work on efficiency within their thermal grid. So the more customers that can convert from steam to hot water, the more energy savings that um, we can enjoy. Um, and when folks do convert, um, there's an average of about 26% efficiency savings for those hot water customers. So it's an advantage for us as a system to reduce emissions, but it's also an advantage for the customer. So um, that utility is doing a lot of work. Our water utility is also stepping up and continuing to do things like replacing water mains that are leaking, um, which increases our efficiency of that utility, and then also installing advanced metering um, which will be able to detect leaks quicker and save water, which also saves energy. Um, to reduce emissions, we're also working on our fleet. Um, so we have a fleet work group that was created by our fleet manager last year. Um, and through that work group, we adopted a new vehicle replacement policy that really prioritizes electric vehicles, hybrid vehicles, and then the most efficient vehicle in the class um, if we can't um, use those electrics and hybrids. So, um, it's sort of a tiered policy, but um, helps to set a standard for when you are ordering a vehicle, this is what you should go through this sort of like decision tree and look for the most efficient one possible. Um, the holdup to implementing that policy, as everyone knows, has been supply chain. Um, so we're, we're ready and willing to go and kind of waiting on a lot of supply chain issues on our fleet transition. But in the meantime, we do have a hybrid ladder truck on order which will help reduce emissions and idling um, on the scene of emergencies, which is really great. Our police continue to prioritize hybrids. They've been sort of the leads um, in the city for that. And then we are replacing some street sweepers and helping improve efficiency of keeping our streets and our streams clean too. Um, on that community scale of reducing emissions, the city partnered with the uh, utility Minnesota Power. Um, they own 1.6 megawatts of solar, which is leased from um, on leased land from the city. And we're using those lease payments to the city for that land, for that solar project to refill our energy fund. So all those payments go straight to projects that will help us continue to work on energy improvement within um, the city. But the, the biggest benefit, of course, is that 
this is generating enough solar power in our community um, to power about 300 homes. So uh, kudos to Minnesota Power on a great project. All right, the second objective in the climate plan was about community resilience. And um, a lot of conversation has been happening at Seaside and in the community about what does resiliency mean? When we talk about resilient housing, that should be energy efficient, healthy, you know, free of lead, protected from water runoff and flooding. Um, what does a resilient transportation system look like? Um, obviously we need some um, mass transit options to be improved. Um, how do we promote health within transportation? Um, prioritizing walking and biking infrastructure too. And then how do we just generally reduce emissions? Our resilient stormwater system, what does that look like? Well, handling localized flooding, um, taking care of coastal flooding, and, and integrating green infrastructure to work with our great infrastructure um, to sort of take away some of that risk. Um, and what do resilient neighborhoods look like? That's been another conversation too. Um, and, and how do we foster that and partner with folks to strengthen neighborhood um, resiliency? Um, in this category, we've made very minimal progress on some of our natural resource management program plan, um, but we've made a lot of progress in some of the other areas, including um, just working on uh, population vulnerability, affordable housing, um, and some of our resiliency in our utilities too. So I'll try to highlight a couple of those progress in the next slides. Um, we made a lot of progress working on infrastructure and critical services and resiliency. Uh, recently, we were awarded a water uh, a a grant for the water plant that will give us um, over $7 million in FEMA hazard mitigation funding to add a second transformer and some backup power, bury our overhead lines, and then update switch gear at our water plant, which really adds a lot of resiliency to that operation. Um, some shoreline stabilization, stabilization work at our water plant also has been completed. It's on the shore of Lake Superior. It's vulnerable to big storms. Um, so that shoreline stabilization and kind of preserving that intake pipe was a priority. Um, we're working on lead water line replacement, like many communities are, and how do we reduce the cost for that for homeowners um, and renters as well. Um, we're, we have lots of coastline here, um, not just on the St. Louis River, but also on Lake Superior, and we're experiencing a lot of coastal erosion. And so both at like the Park Point beach erosion issue, but also lots of areas along sort of more the rocky stretches and um, the clay stretches where um, we're working to prioritize, assess and prioritize coastal restoration efforts. Um, on the green infrastructure side, we have a Duluth stormwater resiliency plan that just kicked off. Thank you to MPCA for the planning money, um, but that's gonna look at sort of citywide vulnerability um, and stormwater resiliency opportunities, but also do a deep dive and focus in on one environmental justice neighborhood too. And we're not just planning for stormwater resiliency, we're also doing some implementation projects. So we will see in green infrastructure projects go in the ground um, in Irving Park on King Creek, and then in Lincoln Park on Miller Creek, and more to come on Miller Creek as well as we pursue additional funding. Um, partnered with um, our colleagues at Minnesota Sea Grant, we're also performing a code audit to look at where in our development code are there barriers to, to uh, implementing green infrastructure for stormwater runoff. Um, so that is just kicking off as well. In um, conclusion, we're also continuing to work on more legacy pollution in the river and cleanup and access work. Um, and so have tons of state and federal nonprofit and tribal partners that help us with that. Um, on the community resiliency side, in terms of affordable housing, the city has been busy. Um, we have prioritized affordable housing. Um, dedicating 19 million of our uh, America Rescue Plan dollars towards affordable housing projects. Also establishing a Duluth Housing Trust Fund um, with local nonprofits. Um, and then the Sustainability Office has led an effort to um, look for recommendations on energy equity concerns. How do we work on multifamily housing and energy equity for renters? Um, so the results of that study will be published very soon and then help inform our policies internally. Um, Rebuild Duluth is an effort to encourage and incentivize private development to infill vacant lots in Duluth as well. So some of that on sort of the city provided affordable housing and then some on the private side too. In terms of strengthening neighborhoods, um, we applied for and were awarded a Love Your Block grant um, through Cities of Service through the Bloomberg Network. And so this has been a really fun way to sort of strengthen community and city connections and also give away some mini grants and help 
with neighborhood blight and cleanup projects. Um, but the, the real value there is certainly the relationships forming um, and strengthening around that. We're working on our urban tree canopy. I um, just got a forestry grant from the Minnesota DNR to accelerate our emerald ash borer uh, efforts, remove those ash trees and replant them with a more diverse selection of trees um, for resiliency in the future. And that is not just for um, you know, shade, but also for air quality, stormwater runoff, and all the benefits that urban tree canopy provides. And lastly, um, working in the emergency planning space and sort of that response to emergencies, we continue to coordinate with the Ready North Network. And I'll mention a little bit later, we got a new uh, Department of Energy RACER grant to study where we can use solar and storage to, to beef up our critical infrastructure and uh, services. Um, on the community side, one of the things that's really helping us work on resiliency is having some technical assistance through the Department of Energy's Communities LEAP grant. So we were one of 22 communities uh, to get funding and resources and through NREL to really focus in on the Lincoln Park neighborhood, which is our um, environmental justice neighborhood that ticks almost every box um, and has health disparities that are in the top 5% of Minnesota. Um, so we really focused in on Lincoln Park um, and this program is bringing in resources, expertise, advice, um, bringing together stakeholder groups around transportation, housing, support, um, and helping us figure out what is the pathway for a clean and energy, uh, clean energy transition for this neighborhood. And then how do we keep this neighborhood and affordable housing going with that transition? So it's sort of a two, uh, two pronged approach. So thanks to our partners at the National Renewable Energy Lab for their assistance. This is an ongoing um, two-year project. And I think uh, we'll, we will see lots of implementation in the future informed by this project. So I'm very excited about it. And it has tons of community partners. And at the top of the list is Equilibrium 3, which is a, a nonprofit working in the Lincoln Park neighborhood. And they've been absolutely um, instrumental in getting this community's LEAP grant and helping us lead it and gather these partners. So super grateful to them. Um, coming back to the city side, we do have a natural gas utility. And one thing I think, you know, we're struggling with is to meet our conservation improvement goal. Um, we have yet to meet that. We're, we work to meet it every year and we've yet to meet it. So how do we get over that hump? Maybe we can look to things like the Eco Act and this fuel switching potential and program potential that might help us get there. Um, our staff were really close and then COVID hit. Um, but we're really looking forward to like, okay, let's meet that goal, make sure we're getting that, you know, that goal met, but also how do we get that energy transition conversation going? Our advisory board, the Energy Plan Commission has been really helpful for pushing for a plan of action from the natural gas utility. And we're watching really closely the progress that other utilities are making in their planning, their innovation planning. Um, and then they've also stepped up to be a partner on the community geothermal grant that we've just submitted to Department of Energy, which I'll talk about in a minute too. Okay, so the third objective in the plan was uh, really about policies, enabling action through policies. And this one is probably the most split, about a third, a third, a third. Um, we've been watching the Rochester benchmarking efforts. We haven't quite gotten there because we just don't have the staff for it yet. Um, and um, we're, just, we're just not there on installing clean energy. We need a plan for where we should put it and what values we need to honor when we install clean energy. So we're getting to that. Um, but we've also made some progress in some policies, um, especially in the area of buildings um, and some parking revisions that are up. We adopted a building performance requirement. We've reduced residential solar fees. Um, we're working on revising our unified development code, eliminating minimums for parking and adding bike and EV requirements. And those are all under review right now. Um, the kind of the efforts around adding our first protected bike lane, and then how do we transition that into a permanent protected bike lane in the Lincoln Park neighborhood um, is part of another federal grant that we'll be working on called RAISE. Um, and then just having our transportation planner working with the Duluth Transit Authority and their Better Bus program, which is um, was really taking our, our bus system forward. So we're excited about that too. And the city's been lucky to engage in things like the state climate action framework. Um, I got to serve on the state uh, transportation advisory uh, council with MnDOT. And then we've engaged in some other policies like betterbuildings.org and some other things to support 
um, energy transition. Uh, some of the things that you might have heard that the city is working on are really about our waterfront. And I'm really proud of my colleagues um, in property management, um, property and facilities and our project management, because they're really doing a good job of looking at all the waterfront where can we acquire waterfront land to protect it? Where can we reconfigure the waterfront? Where can we restore um, some of the areas that need you know, to be beefed up from erosion impacts? But also where can we protect those waterfronts and provide access to them? And then where is development appropriate? And so they go through a pretty, pretty great stage. And when we look at some of the projects that have happened like the Canal Park Lake Walk restoration, um, that reconstruction, um, is way more resilient. Um, and we had some really bad storms this fall that they got through without problems. So we're really grateful for that. Um, and areas that weren't part of this restoration did get damaged. So we know it's working. Um, that was a hard choice. And um, it was uh, to build it up and, and raise that and really deepen the, um, the concrete wall and then also add rock strategically to protect that shoreline was not a cheap investment. And having partners from FEMA there to help us and the city and the state to all come together for that restoration was really great. The lessons we learned in sort of retreat are being transferred to other areas to um, a popular park called Bright Beach. We're actually abandoning a road and taking it away from the shoreline and making more natural areas and native plantings closer to the shoreline. So um, sometimes that retreat can happen horizontally along with vertically. Uh, there's also some current studies going on to help us prioritize other areas of coastal erosion on Park Point. Um, those of you without Great Lakes don't have to worry about this, but it's like a whole area of resiliency that Duluth is dealing with um, is some of the steeper areas of erosion. So making a plan for those and grateful to have assistance. We have some FEMA dollars for the advanced assistance study and then partners with the Army Corps of Engineers on the Park Point Beach Road. Lastly, um, in the financing these climate actions, um, we made quite a bit of progress. Um, and I'll just shout out to our finance department who's been really awesome and patient with us as we you know, bring in grants left and right, and then they have to help us administer them and track them. So super grateful for our partners there. Um, but we've been working really hard on not just um, doing external funding, but also seeking sources of internal funding. And um, we do have an internal sustainability fund that's being used mostly to bring in um, and used as a match to bring in other dollars, but also just to partner between departments and um, help things like green infrastructure and hybrid and EV replacements and building energy efficiency and strategic facilities planning and uh, forestry cover. Um, so like all these things happen because we have a s internal sustainability fund, super grateful for that. Um, in terms of external funding, the only thing I can say is in the past, couple of years, there's been over 34 million brought in for projects from all of these different agencies. We've gone to some private um, uh, philanthropy associations, but we've also gone to state and federal departments. Um, our Lake Superior Coastal Program has been a partner, um, Lisa, NOAA RISE team. Uh, we've been just grateful to work with all of these partners and help us get our work done because we can't do it alone. Um, so what's next for Duluth? Uh, Lauren, do we have five more minutes? I can't, maybe thumbs up. Okay, perfect. Um, so what's next to Duluth? What's next for Duluth? Um, I previewed this a little bit, but we got a Department of Energy RACER grant. RACER stands for Renewables Advancing Community Energy Resiliency. Um, and so this will pay for city staff salaries and travel and indirect costs to help plan for solar and storage use within the city and develop a toolkit for other cities to use. Um, it also funds some contractor work um, to really dig into solar siting and de-risk some of these projects for us, and then um, bring together some um, project partners to help us have a community conversation about where would solar and storage be of value to community during emergencies. Um, so we're really excited about this funding and we're just kicking off. Hopefully we have the fiscal contract signed by March 1st, um, and then we can get started right away. This also allows me to hire a two-year position. So if anybody wants to move to Duluth for a couple of years and work on solar planning, um, think about Mindy Granley and come work with us. Um, and we will be posting that very soon. Um, I mentioned the RAISE grant before, and this is really a, a grant for an active transportation corridor. USDOT um, looked at our application, I think 
saw that we wanted to, you know, make a street of the future, that we have existing partnerships with the Lincoln Park neighborhood, with Equilibrium 3, with the county, and um, that we want to just make a historic change in this roadway. So this is a map, if you've been to Duluth, it's just west of downtown, um, but the West Superior Street corridor connects Lincoln Park to the downtown. Right now, the box in yellow that you can see is a huge infrastructure project um, being led by MnDOT um, with a highway interchange. So this is a neighborhood under a lot of construction and a lot of pressure. Um, and, and those interchange projects are really not serving the neighborhood. It's helping people get through the neighborhood, right? But this West Superior Street project, which will be the red line, this is going to serve the neighborhood. And we are looking at human scale infrastructure. How do we get people around and transportation? How do we support local economic development? We've got a lot of entrepreneurial businesses in this area. Um, and then also how do we model what we want our streets to look like in the future? How do they support the new better um, transit programs, the better busing transit program that DTA has? How do we better treat stormwater runoff? How do we accommodate all the e-bikes we see around Duluth? Um, how do we, you know, integrate electric vehicle charging and LED lighting and um, native plants and aesthetics of the neighborhood. So all of these things will be components of the project. And hopefully we'll see some tree trenches and biofiltration and EV charging and e-bike charging and upgraded lighting and all the great things. Um, but bus accessibility and walk-in bike infrastructure are priorities and they're written into the grant. They're not an option for us to consider. Um, we're really excited about West Superior Street project. It's just kicking off right now. Um, lastly, uh, the energy efficiency and conservation block grants that are coming from Department of Energy from the IIJA, um, we plan to use those to do some strategic facilities planning. I have been bugging all my colleagues around the state, uh, shout out to John and Hutchinson, shout out to Rochester and others who have patiently walked me through how your cities work on facilities strategic planning. And after a while hearing these conversations, it just really occurred to me that, wow, we just don't have capacity to do this in-house. So my plan for EECBG funds is to use that um, formula funding um, to apply for a strategic facilities planning process or function and really bring a contractor in to help us through that. So um, it's a need in our city. We know we're behind other cities. We look to all of you and your great efforts and we will learn from them. So thank you. Um, oh, lastly, I forgot. I was gonna tell you about our community geothermal heating and cooling grant. We literally just got um, the encouragement to proceed and we answered some questions for Department of Energy. We're really excited. This is going to help us um, during that West Superior Street project. Remember that big red line? Um, the idea is to recover waste heat from wastewater treatment plant effluent and then sink that heat into our hot water district energy system along with some geothermal heat pumps. And Initial calculations show that with that heat recovery and a couple of geothermal heat pumps, we could heat all of the Lincoln Park corridor along West Superior Street, every building, plus 40% of our downtown buildings on the district energy system. Um, so we're really excited about that preliminary results. We hope that this um, phase one feasibility study is funded. If it is funded, we get to design the system and then we're eligible to apply for phase two construction support too. Um, Decarbonizing that entire corridor and 40% of our downtown buildings would be a dream come true. So uh, we're really um, hopeful that this, this grant will allow us to proceed. All right, and I think that's it. So I will turn it back to Lauren and see if we have any questions. Thank you so much for your patience and for um, allowing me the chance to talk to you all. Thank you, Mindy, for sharing. It's so fun to see the similarities and differences between different communities across the state and just learn more about what you're doing and sustainability really can touch so many different projects and departments and programs. So just managing all of that and, and keeping different people working on this is amazing. There are a few questions in the chat that I'll ask and work through, and then I'll just open it up for anyone else here if there are additional questions. The first one is, what does residential solar fees reduced mean? Is this purchase of equipment, metering? Oh, great question. Um, when you go to register your project with the construction services office, you pay a fee for any home improvement project. Well, um, one of the first things I did when I got to the city was really compare what Duluth's fee was with some of the other cities around the state. And um, 
some of you all were just making us look bad and down to like $50 for a, a fee for solar. So um, we just took a chance and looked at that fee schedule and, and talked about what it, what would be a fair fee. Because you can recover costs for staff time to work on those, but you can't exceed those costs. Um, and you also can't um, make it so cheap that you can't recover those costs. But we somewhere in between to help encourage residential solar, we were able to reduce that fee. So when you go to apply for that project on your house, it just is um, a nominal fee now instead of it used to be a percentage of the project value. So one of those small things you can do to just take away a little bit of that barrier um, for residential solar. And hopefully with the new Inflation Reduction Act, 30% credit for solar, um, you know, being guaranteed for the next 10 years, like hopefully between that and reducing the solar fee schedule, we'll see uh, a ramp up in residential solar. Although I have been looking at the solar installation, um, solar installations in Duluth and um, residential solar isn't necessarily a barrier. Like residential solar adoption is exceeding commercial building solar adoption um, in those trends. So I'm really looking at like, how do we beef up that commercial um, solar and then also public buildings solar as well. A great question. Great. Yeah, it's just a fee to apply. Tack on those incentives for consumers. Yeah. The next, the next one here is it's exciting to hear about some many projects funded through grants. How much of your time is spent on grant administration? Any learnings from working through grants that you would highlight? Oh, that's a great question. Um, a lot of my time recently has been spent on grants, and I think it's because you know, the first year or two was really focused on coming to agreement about what climate action meant for the city. Once we had that agreement and alignment, that opens the door to say, okay, the only barrier here is funding. Let's go get some funding. Um, and so I would say the first couple of years, not as much. I would say the last year, a lot of my time, probably 40% of my time is on grants, um, acquiring, administering, you know, reporting, all that stuff. So probably about 40% of my time so far. Um, some of the learnings is start early, talk to your colleagues, make sure you have buy-in from the different departments and support. Um, and if I were interested in the grant game, I would immediately go to finance and say, how can I get some match funding so that I have a pot of funding for match for future projects? And that would be something that I would advise anybody working in sustainability to make sure you have that sort of match funding assembled, get your partners on board. Um, and then uh, be nice to your finance team because they will end up with a lot more work on their plate um, to administer these funds. Uh, so that would be my advice. The last one in the chat also kind of touches on the impressive work being done, especially with all the different grant utilizations and partnerships. Um, going back to earlier in the presentation, how long did the internal and external emissions data collection take? Did you use external partners for the community-wide emissions? Absolutely. The community-wide emissions are actually from the Regional Indicators Project. Um, I think Rochester has got their emissions tracked in the Regional Indicators Progress, too. Um, so yeah, that is done, I believe, mostly by LHB staff um, who lead the regional indicators. And my hope is that that funding will stay steady so they can continue to look at those um, carbon emissions as our community because I don't have time and capacity um, to, to do that. And like you, you hinted at, how long does that data collection take? It would take me forever. So keeping that regional indicators um, Minnesota program going is a priority for many cities. We don't have capacity to look at all of the, the factors around transportation and, and waste and buildings. Um, but internally for the city, it's not that oppressive. We use ClearPath calculator that um, is provided by ICLE, Local Governments for Sustainability. They were one of those logos on the first slide. That ClearPath calculator and some of just like measuring um, how many kilowatts we use, how many, you know, CCF of natural gas we use, how much steam or hot water we use from district energy. And we have the, you know, the factors determined, um, what are our number of miles and number of gallons of gas and like all that stuff. That's pretty simple. We um, usually have a Green Corps or an AmeriCorps member. Um, that's a really good task for them to gather all that data and bug everybody. But once you get all your city colleagues trained about that data that you need, um, that one's really not that oppressive for um, data collection. But yeah, without regional indicators, I don't know how I would get community-wide emissions, um, but the city emissions we have a good handle on. 
One more question in the chat here. Could you please share a bit more about what's included in the building owner performance requirements? I would love to. And I'll tell you a quick story about why they exist. <laughs> One of our biggest buildings um, on Garfield Avenue was re-roofed about two years ago, three years ago, right when I just started. And I started poking around and asking, oh, I see there's a roofing project going on. Like how much extra insulation are we adding? How is it becoming more resilient to climate? Um, how are we gonna save energy, et cetera, et cetera, right? Um, but the answer I got back was not very satisfactory. The answer was, ah, they're just putting back what we had up there. It's all we could afford. Um, some people may have seen that as, oh, it's a lost opportunity. I saw it as we just reset the lifespan of that building without doing the energy work. And that's not gonna happen again. So we need to decide um, if we can't afford to redo the, the building without those energy and resilience things, well, then we wait. We have to wait. We have to have that funding. We have to work on energy efficiency at everything. So that's sort of where the impetus for working on that building owner performance um, standard started. I'd be happy to share the policy with everybody, um, but the scope of it is really for city buildings, all over a hundred city buildings that we have. The scope is any new buildings or major renovations or mechanical upgrades. Um, and then um, the, the policies internally relate to roof assemblies, um, insulation, um, HVAC equipment and control systems. Um, digital direct control systems are what Alex Jackson, our energy coordinator, prefers. Um, it includes things like we will be doing commissioning for every project. Um, we need to be commissioning all our systems. If you don't do commissioning, you're going to miss out and you're not going to have things that work. Um, it, it includes things like planning for flexible fuel systems. So maybe if we have to use natural gas now, we still think about electrifying that in the future and making that future electrification possibility built into the project. So some, a little bit of energy resiliency. Um, it includes building envelope standards, um, some of the electrical components, lighting standards, window standards, um, standards for low flow fixtures, high efficiency hand dryers, rainwater, accessibility, uh, including gender neutral bathrooms, so a little bit of equity in there, how we heat water, the room for janitor closets and equipment, um, making sure that we have room for the uh, janitorial equipment, um, you know, specifying stuff like carpet, low, low, air, low air emissions uh, for different things, low maintenance things, EV charging requirements, um, and then uh, just like high efficiency data centers for IT and stuff like that. But I'm happy to share the policy if anyone wants to see it. We based it off of learning from our peers at St. Louis County. Uh, so shout out to Pete and Jerry over there. Um, Pete and Jerry really had a simple, flexible one. Uh, we thought about, let's just adopt B3 and go for it. And it was like, well, you know, some of our buildings are like these little tiny rec buildings that are only heated, you know, one season out of the year or aren't heated at all. And so we, we needed something that was had a little more flexibility. So it has to be robust, but also offer some flexibility. Um, so yeah, I, it's probably not perfect. And we actually keep thinking of things that we should add to it the next time we revise it. Um, like some of the building door locks and the, the controls now how you can use your key card to like get in everywhere. Um, forgot to put those in there. And we had a project where we had to spend a few thousand dollars to like upgrade the locks because it wasn't in the policy. And they were like, well, you didn't have it in there. Okay. So we know it's not perfect, but it was a great starting point. Mostly it just was great to get agreement across all different departments. So we don't get those projects slipping through the cracks of one of our largest buildings being re-roofed without added insulation. Um, so sometimes you learn from your mistakes and you do better and you move on and that shows the reason for why we need these policies. There are a few comments um, of interest in that policy. So if you are happy to share it, we can follow up with the materials from today and share that with everyone as well. Absolutely. I think I can share it in the chat as well, but I can send Perfect. it to you. That was it for our chat questions. I'll open it up if anyone else has any additional questions for Mindy. We do have another one in the chat here. I'll just go ahead and ask it. Perfect. Um, really enjoyed hearing about your goals for transitioning um, from fossil fuels. Do you run into challenges in a super cold climate where heating is a big load? Can you share how you're approaching that? Tactics, partnerships, 
peer cities in our climate? Sure. Um, that's one of our biggest tasks for the Communities Leap expertise that we're bringing in through the uh, DOE's Communities Leap grant is to ask our NREL folks. They're actually working on a, a res stock and a comm stock model of the Lincoln Park neighborhood to give us some of those answers. What are the heating loads for um, different types of residential um, construction and different types of commercial construction? How do we model those so that we know like how much recovered heat or other um, sources that we can gather? I think the main focus so far has been on sort of district energy, district heating and decarbonizing that district system. Um, but we know that electrification um, is probably not going to do it up in our cold climate. I mean, we're climate zone seven. I think we're the only the only part that's climate zone seven in the state of Minnesota. So some of the stuff that is going to work in St. Paul and Rochester is not going to work here. Um, but there is an added resiliency of folks getting cold climate heat pumps in their homes. Um, if it helps reduce their amount of fossil fuel, that's the first place we stand, right? We scaffold, that's the first stair, is to try to partially electrify. How we get to that last 20 or 30%, I don't know yet. Um, I think district energy is a solution. Geothermal district energy is one of the solutions, but we've got to prove that. We've got to make it affordable and we got to not price people out of their homes. Um, no matter what the solution for fuel switching is, we can start with efficiency and conservation right now. Um, and then partially electrify. I don't have the answer yet, but it's gonna be a community conversation to get there. We need designers, we need the private sector, we need you know big businesses to take a lead on this. We need, you know, uh, we've got a, a housing company called Green New Deal Housing, look them up. Green New Deal Housing is, is starting to try to build affordable plans for net zero homes. And they've got two specs out there and they're building um, a demonstration project and they're, they're hoping to be able to build, you know, family homes at a, a decent market price, you know, um, that are net zero. And uh, so we've got lots of cool partners to work with in Duluth that are really into this, but we, I don't know the answer yet. I, I would tell people that's a phase two problem, right? But, yeah, lots of work to do. Another question here, over the past couple of years, I've seen more press identifying Duluth as a climate change refuge. Are you able to leverage this in your grant applications or take it into account for planning purposes? Brian, I should, shouldn't I? I don't know, I'm gonna put it on my list to try to leverage that. But yes, people are you know, pointing to Duluth as like a place that will have um, less severe climate impacts, right? Because we're still having climate impacts. Look at our lakeshore, look at these erosion problems. Look at having to spend millions of dollars to protect our um, waterfront development and our thriving commercial districts. Like um, we're gonna have climate impacts. We had the 2012 flood. We had a 2016 derecho that took out power for most of the city for over two days. Um, we do have climate impacts here. And so I always try to tell that like, we will have climate adaptation that we need to do, um, but it will be things less severe than this type of flooding that Florida is seeing and the type of hurricanes and the, uh, the droughts and the fires that other communities are having. We want to be a place that works on resiliency, whether that's for the 86,000 people who live here right now, or if it's for 120,000 people in the next 20 years. I don't know what that's gonna be, but, I like this idea of trying to leverage that opportunity in grant applications. I did get a chance to talk to FEMA Region 5 at their regional meeting this fall and really tell them like what being a climate refuge means. Here's the types of resiliency that these cities need to be working on that you can help us work on um, through FEMA funding. So if, uh, if folks are looking to Great Lakes cities as mild climates and safe from climate change and they want folks to migrate here, will we, we need a lot of work to be done to be ready to take in more people. And that work is stuff that I'm already focused on infrastructure, um, but there's also sort of this community support, resiliency, affordability that uh, we haven't even cracked open yet. So lots of work to do. That being said, I meet people from California and Colorado who are just sick of wildfires. Um, almost every month I meet one person from out West who's just like, I was just so sick of all the smoke and the fires. I just couldn't anymore. And so it's, it seems really anecdotal, but um, 
I don't know, every time I hear a story and I meet somebody that moved here, I just think, wow, maybe this is real. To be determined. I great think question. we have it great here in Minnesota. <laughs> yeah, our problems are smaller problems and affordable and, and easy to solve with technology available right now. Um, so if we can have a more resilient housing stock and get that energy efficiency built in and energy transition going, if we can solve these shoreland flooding problems and shoreland erosion problems um, and get our infrastructure beefed up to handle bigger storms, like we're gonna be in a really good place to accept more people. And all the great diversity and um, economic growth that comes with it too, right? Like let's look on the bright side. All right, any other final questions from anyone here? Well, thank you very much. I had a lot of fun talking to you all. Thanks for joining us today and sharing a lot of great stuff. Thanks everyone for the questions and the engaging conversation here. Um, we'll follow up with the materials and share those out with everyone for the recording and the presentation slides. Mm -hmm.